excited. So welcome folks. I'm Ash. I do event coordination for Firestorm Books and Coffee. And I'm really excited to host this event tonight featuring two historians, Mark Bray and Jorel Melendez Badillo, discussing the radical legacy of Francisco Ferrer and the modern school. It's a real honor to host this conversation, and I hope the information it offers about the possibility of anarchist pedagogy will be valuable and useful for listeners in our audience tonight and in the future. Um, for folks attending an event with us for the first time, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a 13-year-old worker-owned cooperative and radical bookstore in so-called Asheville, North Carolina on occupied Cherokee territory. Our bookstore carries a wide selection of general interest titles and political thought with a focus on queer, feminist, and anarchist voices and culture. But we also carry books related to things like gardening, herbalism, cookbooks, and poetry, as well as an extensive children's and middle grade inventory that most folks might not expect from a radical bookstore. Um, we're also in an event space and host a wide range of workshops, film screenings, and presentations, as well as meetings for various grassroots community organizations. Since the start of the pandemic, we transitioned our events to an online virtual space and will likely continue with virtual events through the end of the year or until it is safe to meet again in person. Um, but I am excited to share that after 15 months of closure, our doors are now open to the public three days a week, Friday through Sunday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, we've been open the past two weekends and it's been really wonderful to reconnect with folks. So if you're local or if you wanna take a trip to come check us out, you can totally do that now. <laughs> and we would love to see you. Um, in the meantime, we continue to sell books online through our website, which I will link to in the chat and in the comments on the live stream. Tonight's event was also organized in collaboration with our friends at PM Press. Uh, PM Press is an independent radical publisher that aims to deliver bold political ideas and vital stories like the kinds featured in our conversation tonight. We've been collaborating on a series of events with PM Press for a few months now and look forward to hosting more events with them in the future. Um, so if you're interested in staying up to date on all of our events, make sure to follow us on social media as well as our website's community calendar, which I will also link to in the chat in the comments. Um, one last thing uh, before introducing our speakers, there will be some time at the end of tonight's event for audience Q&A. Um, so for folks who are attending through Zoom, I'll encourage you to submit questions throughout the discussion by using the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen. Um, no need to wait until the end to submit your questions as Mark and Jarrell are talking, uh, if you've got things that come up with you, for you, feel free to just submit those questions as the conversation's happening and we'll make sure to get to them. Um, cool. I will go ahead and turn my attention now to our guests and we'll get going with the event. Uh, so tonight we're going to hear about Mark Bray's latest work, Anarchist Education and the Modern School, co-edited co with Robert Haworth. Um, Mark will be joined in conversation with by Jarrell Melendez Badillo as they discuss some of the inter intersections of their work, as well as Francisco Ferrer's modern school and the movement it inspired around the world. Um, many of the writings featured in the reader have been translated into English for the first time. And it is the first historical reader to gather together Ferrer's writing on rationalist education, revolutionary violence, and the general strike, and put them into conversation with the letters, speeches, and articles of his comrades, collaborators, and critics. Um, 
So if you've not had a chance to check it out, I really hope you will, as it contains vital information for anyone interested in radical education and anarchist pedagogy. Um, and I will go ahead and drop links to the book in the chat as well. So if you haven't yet, uh, you can check it out. Cool. Um, so Mark Gray is a political organizer and historian of human rights and politics in modern Europe. He earned his BA in philosophy from Wesleyan University in 2005 and his PhD in history from Rutgers University in 2016. He is the author of two previous works, Antifa, the Anti-Fascist Handbook, and Translating Anarchy, The Anarchism of Occupy Wall Street. He is currently a lecturer at Rutgers University. Jarrell Melendez Badillo is a historian of Latin America and the Caribbean with a particular focus on the global circulation of radical ideas from the standpoint of working class intellectual communities. He has published journal and newspaper articles on the histories of anarchism, labor, and radical politics in Puerto Rico and Latin America, and is currently an assistant professor of history at Dartmouth College. Mark, Jarrell, thank you so much for being here tonight and offering this dialogue. And I will go ahead and hand it over to Mark. Well, thank you, Ash. Uh, thank you to everyone at Firestorm. Thank you to PM. Thanks, Jarrell, for joining me. Um, we had another talk uh, together about this topic a few years ago up in New Hampshire. Um, and it's good to see you after all this time. Thank you to everyone who tuned in. I see some familiar names. So if I know who you are, know that I know that you're here and thank you for coming. Um, so what I'm gonna do, which is a little different from my past presentations on this, is I'm gonna give a little um, 10 minutes or so uh, picture discussion, who was Francisco Ferrer, what was up with the modern school for people that don't know. Um, normally I do a longer bit on that when I'm solo, but after that, Jarell and I are going to have a conversation about that and our related topics. So I'm going to share my screen so you can see the pictures. Hopefully this works. It asking me to allow Zoom to access my screen. I have to open my system preferences. All right, well, <clears throat> I should have tried this in advance. Let's see what the system preferences say. Allow the apps below to record the contents. We've got to click the lock to make the changes. Yes. All right, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm just gonna talk without pictures. Okay, so who was Francisco Ferrer? Francisco Ferrer was an, a Catalan anarchist pedagogical figure born in 1859 in a small town outside of Barcelona. Um, he only had formal education up until the age of 13 or so and his early political career in Spain was as a kind of radical Republican, one of the, not like the Republican in the US, but the faction that wanted to get rid of the king, uh, the monarchy in Spain. Fast forward a bit, he's in exile in Paris in the 1880s into the 1890s. He claimed he went into exile in order to escape um, persecution for his alleged role in an uprising against the king. More likely he left because he had problems with his wife, but if you want to get into the sordid personal details of Francisco Ferrer and his various love interests and children, which are rather entertaining, we can get to that later. But he's in Paris in the 1880s into the 1890s, and he's increasingly disenchanted with the French Third Republic, right? For Republicans of the time, the French Third Republic established in 1871 was the ideal. And when he got there, he claimed that basically um, all they had done from his vantage point was replace God and the king um, with the state. So he becomes increasingly interested in anarchism over the time. And by the mid 1890s, um, French anarchism is influenced in large part by two influential currents, the first being libertarian education. And for those who don't know, 
uh, libertarian in this case is a synonym for anarchist and uh, revolutionary syndicalism. So he's getting interested in these anarchist ideas and to make money, he is teaching Spanish. One of his students is a wealthy woman named Ernestine Munier, who is rather conservative, but through working with Ferrer, it drifts farther and farther to the left. She agrees to leave uh, a substantial part of her wealth to him in her will, and then dies actually less than three months later. Ferrer uses this, this wealth that she left for him, which they agreed would be used for educational purposes to, to open the modern school, which starts in Barcelona in 1901. So let's talk a little bit about the, the modern school to, to catch you up on, on what that was all about. Ferrer admitted that he was not an original pedagogical thinker, that he um, read a lot, he gained ideas from other people who had been um, experimenting with ideas on libertarian education. Really the reason, one of the main reasons why we remember Ferrer's initiative as opposed to other efforts that anarchists made earlier is because he had the money to open the institution. French anarchists in, in the 1890s were trying a similar project and couldn't get the funds together to open an actual building. But Ferrer opens the modern school in 1901. And although initially a number of the principles of the school were more tradition, traditional and authoritarian than they would become later, over time, the point of emphasis is on um, a lack of rewards and punishments, co-educational uh, environmental settings with boys and girls, which was not the norm in Spain at the time, uh, a focus on a natural, a natural world, uh, rationality, science, instead of um, what he would consider to be superstitious religious practices. Um, and so over the course of the next several years, the, the class sizes of the modern school get slightly bigger and bigger in Barcelona. And then the story takes a bit of a left turn in 1906 when the administrator of the modern school uh, publishing house, uh, an anarchist named Mateo Moral, throws a bomb at the, the king and queen on their way home from their wedding. They are unharmed. He ends up taking his own life shortly thereafter, and Ferrer is arrested as an alleged accomplice, uh, and his school is shut down. Uh, he is actually acquitted. I think there's reason to believe, I get into it in more detail in the book, that he actually was involved in this conspiracy. We can talk about why that was so later, but the school is shut down. Ferrer goes into exile, 1907, 1908, and he writes a book about the principles of the modern school called La Escuela Moderna, which is translated for the first time in its entirety in English in Anarchist Education in the Modern School, the book that I put together with Rob Hayworth. And he doesn't come back really to Spain for any long period of time until 1909. And this is where the tragic end of the story uh, comes up. Uh, there was a rebellion in, in Barcelona, Catalonia, the surrounding areas against a colonial war in Morocco. People were rebelling because they, the poor people were being conscripted to fight, rich people could buy their way out. And this rebellion, which was really on a scale that um, Spain had not seen in a number of decades, um, was most well known for the demolition and the burning of religious institutions around Barcelona. Dozens of churches and convents are burned and even some of the, um, the corpses of nuns are disinterred uh, and brought out into public, dropped in front of the homes of rich people. In short, the reason why people did it namely was because there were these urban legends that the clergy had been essentially kidnapping women and torturing them uh, when they became nuns, they were looking for evidence. Anyway, long story short, Ferrer is blamed as the instigator of this rebellion without evidence and is executed in 1909. But the story doesn't just end there because after his execution and in part perhaps because of it, this uh, a protest movement develops around um, Europe, the Americas and beyond, and even more significantly, the modern school movement develops where educators are really around the world, China, Japan, Poland, Argentina, Cuba, the United States, Italy, create more or less Ferrarian schools to honor his pedagogical legacy. I say more or less Ferrarian because there was not a whole lot of information actually available to a lot of these educators. Um, and so 
in, in many cases, they sort of took the kernel of what Ferrer was up to and then adapted it to their own circumstance. Excuse me. So some of them were, were more um, traditional than others, uh, but this was a kind of alternative school movement that had a really significant legacy up and through the 20s and 30s. Uh, it was the model for education used during the Spanish Revolution, for example. And even in the United States, um, I don't know if there's anyone here from New Jersey, but one of the oldest lasting Ferrarian schools, um, which started in New York, ended up in central New Jersey near Rutgers, lasted up into the 1940s, uh, I believe it was. So anyway, that's a really short gloss. We're going to get into more of the details in the conversation that Jarell and I are going to have. The main takeaways that I, I want to leave you with at this point is that Ferrer was this kind of unusual, unorthodox, at times um, contradictory, paradoxical, anarchist, pedagogical figure. Also someone who is deeply committed to uh, the general strike towards insurrection against the monarchy, although he didn't talk about that publicly. I think we'll discuss that more later. And the institution he created doesn't necessarily fit into the box that many people today would imagine for something that would be called in one form or another anarchist education. Um, I think the general tendency today is to imagine something like anarchist education being maybe not a free-for-all, but something that's very open-ended, student-driven, um, and the modern school was mostly not like that. I mean, it was like that compared to what was going on at the time in, in, in conservative Catholic Spain, but it was more regimented than you might expect. Um, in the book, there are schedules for the school day where you can see something that would look rather familiar in a public school in the United States, right? Like one to two math and then two to three art or, or what have you, right? It was, it was, it was regimented, it was orderly. Um, and, and that's largely because Ferrer, his idea for liberatory education was focused principally on the content of the education, less so on the form. And so as the book gets into, um, there are interesting debates with other anarchists who argue that a, a truly liberatory education should be free in form without what they would refer to as dogma or ideology. So one of the kind of interesting questions that I, I encourage readers or listeners to take out of this is, if you're coming at um, the question of teaching and learning from an anti-authoritarian perspective, what is the relationship between form and content and what that looks like? Um, how uh, is the goal to synthesize? Should things lean one way or the other? Um, so I look, for, look forward to questions on that. Um, and yeah, I'm sorry that was maybe slightly uh, discombobulated compared to what I had in mind, because uh, I would have had pictures. But anyway, Jarell, you want to come back on and we'll we'll do a, a chit chat. Sure. Uh, and that was actually great. I think it was a great summary. And um, I just wanted to say before I start asking you the questions and, and engaging in, in conversation that I wanted to echo the thanks and gratitude to Firestorm, PM Press, Ash, uh, and everyone involved, everyone that's here. And also it's so great to be in conversation with you. Uh, I, I wish we had a beer in our hands uh, as we discuss this, uh, as we've done in the past. Uh, but thank you for, for the invitation to be in dialogue with you and your work. And as I've mentioned in the past to you personally, I think this is such an important contribution uh, to the study of Ferrer, but also to anarchist historiography more broadly. And so I guess that my first question would be about the book in itself and the production of the book. Uh, because I, I feel that the book uh, is part of, you know, an early 20th century anarchist print tradition. It, there was this sort of uh, book as archive model in which they would compile writings and they would compile things and just circulate books. And so I, I feel that the book serves that function of being a mobile archive but at the same time, it offers very important historical analysis uh, that in part you wrote for, for the book. So I just wanted you to talk a little bit more about the research, translating and writing process. And if you could compare that process for this book with your previous work, how was it different? How was it similar? Uh, so just a little bit about the production of the book in itself. Yeah, sure. So the, the basic story starts with PM Press because they have this initiative where they're um, 
releasing new editions of anarchist classics. So there's a bunch, there's, there's a handful of Kropotkin books that are coming out soon that are really neat. Um, uh, the anarchist artist No Bonzo did a kind of classic illustrated print edition of um, Mutual Aid that's really, really beautiful and is coming out. And they wanted to do um, a new edition of Ferrer's modern school book, which the, the 1913 translation was uh, titled The Origins and Ideals of the Modern School. And so they, they got in touch with Rob Hayworth, who's done some really uh, fantastic books on anarchist education. Um, some of them looking at the New Jersey modern school uh, and, and other topics. And um, he was gonna edit a new um, origin and ideals of the modern school book with PM. And and I, I, I knew him from some other stuff and we, we got to talking and where he came at it from the anarchist education angle, I came at it from the anarchism and history of Spain angle. And we complemented each other well, as far as the kind of knowledge and insight into this stuff. And when I started looking at the translate, the tr comparing the original to the, the, the translation from 1913, it, it, the first thing that was evident is, is some, of, some of it's missing. So Ferrer included excerpts of texts from other people, either to say like, yeah, I agree with this person or to sort of like show what the school was up to. And, and the, the uh, English translator in 1913 just cut that all out. Uh, the main reason being that he he wanted this is the context of the aftermath of Ferrer's education. He wanted to win over a largely moderate middle class English audience to these principles. So he wanted to make it concise, and then maybe more importantly, he wanted to make it politically palatable. So some kind of fiery and insurrectionary language that Ferrer kind of stuck in here and there, he smoothed over mm. and changed. You know. Um, so in, in, in basically in the, in the process of working with Rob, we, we decided to do a full version of Ferrer's Modern School. And then um, to me, you can't talk about Ferrer and just talk about the educational stuff. <laughs> because that, that's, you know, that's like, like, a, like um, a historian of like a corporation uh, writing about the corporation based on its own propaganda, so to speak. Because behind the scenes, he was just as committed to revolutionary syndicalism. He used the money that he got from his student, not only for the school, and I'm not sure if she had any idea that he would do that or if she would have approved or disapproved, I don't know, but he used the money to fund um, some of the unions that predated the CMT in Spain. He used it to fund their newspapers. He created a newspaper, um, La Huelga General, which was, if you look at the kind of masthead of, this is, this is slightly, a narco historian geek stuff here, but if you look at the masthead of that paper and the who's who's of contributors, it lists like if you were an important European anarchist who would have written anything pertaining to labor at the time, you were involved in that paper. Mm -hmm. um, really an amazing paper that didn't last that long, but played a key role in the Barcelona general strike of 1902. And moreover, as I say in the book, he had conflictual politics. He was sort of a Republican, sort of an anarchist, this and that. But more than anything, he was a revolutionary and he really wanted to destroy the Spanish uh, monarchy and, and, the, and the government in Spain probably more than anything else. And so there's, there's significant reason to believe that he participated in, a, in a, at least one, maybe two efforts to kill the King of Spain. Publicly though, he didn't talk about that. Publicly, he was just someone who was, who was kind of a non-dogmatic about rationality and science. So I wanted the reader to get the full picture and the full picture through his own writings on it, many of which he didn't write under his name publicly. Um, and I think that it's, when, when you see all the different points in the constellation, they all make a little more sense. Um, and, and I tried to historicize this by pointing out that in a certain sense, he wasn't really all of that unique. There are plenty of other historical figures at the time who had a foot in various different things as we do today, right? People who are politically involved today on the left often spend time focusing on one issue or another or one group or another. Um, so, so that so that was the, the basically the, the kind of outlook. And and by translating all of these documents, English language readers will have access to the full story, which has been known. If you read Spanish, this has been known for a while. 
but there isn't an equivalent reader, but it's been known for a while. But for English language readers, I wanted to connect the dots. Awesome, great, thank you for that. And I guess in that same line of, of question, I wanted to know, I had just written down why Ferrer and why the modern school, why this book, but in ter I think the question is more about your own uh, arrival at Ferrer's, because uh, you mentioned that the book itself was something that PM Press and Rob had been working and you tagged along and provided this sort of broader historical context. Uh, but I wanted to also ask you how you got to Ferrer and maybe that, that is a question about your broader research before arriving at, the, at this project. Sure, um, grad school. So I was writing my dissertation on um, basically the relationship between anarchist propaganda by the deed, which is a euphemism for anarchist attacks on symbols of authority in the 1890s and the early 20th century in Spain and uh, to a lesser extent in France, the kinds of state repression that came in response to that and transnational movements, which I argue ought to be thought of in, the, in, in terms of the history of human rights that emerged in response to state repression. And so a couple of the main episodes I look at are the two Ferrer trials and the movements that develop to liberate Ferrer, 1906 to seven and then 1909. So my entryway into Ferrer was not particularly about the school or the education. It was more about him as this kind of martyr figure, him as potentially a kind of insurrectionary schemer behind the scenes, and him as a kind of middleman, both financial and kind of network middleman in Western European revolutionary plotting at this time. And so I, I was at the International Institute for Social History in Amsterdam. I came across, they have basically almost all of the issues of the modern school newspaper um, available there. And I, I copied them before I, before this book was, was something on my radar. I copied them because they were related to Ferrer and I thought it was cool and I just copied them. Then when I got home to Rob and I, home to the US and I talked to Rob Hayworth, my um, co-editor, I was like, you know what I got? <laughs> and so, so, that, so then, but I'm just gonna um, put in the chat so people can keep, can keep an eye out here is, um, the book that that will become. Uh, it's not going to come out for a while because academic publishing takes a little while. But I just finished the copy edits this morning. So congrats, congrats, congrats. You can you can check out panelists. Uh, oh, can can people see the chat? You have to change it to attendee, panelists and attendees. Oh yeah, yeah, because it occurred to me for a second that I was like, this is only going to the panelists. And, yeah. All right, so now panelists and attendees, you can you can check that out. Um, so it, basically it, it branched off from my other work. And so um, in, in, in anarchist education um, and the modern school, I get into all this stuff. I go into a deeper dive into the insurrectionary and the political stuff in the other book. Great. Great, thank you. And and I have a question about your forthcoming book uh, later on, uh, which I'm super excited about. And I guess uh, this is an unfair question for an Europeanist, but one of the things that I really appreciated about the book, Mark, when I was reading it and that I really geeked out was you, the way that you traced the impact of Ferrer, particularly after his death uh, in the Americas. So I wanted to ask you, uh, if you could talk a little bit about Ferrer's impact beyond Europe, particularly in the Americas, uh, and why is it that he became more popular after his death? Uh, so about his, uh, I guess the question is about his impact beyond Europe, particularly in the Americas, and about his martyrdom. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, you helped me come up with some of that. So <laughs> we'll just kick the, kick the football back and forth here. But um I'll just start out with why, why the martyrdom was such a big deal. Prior to being repressed politically, he wasn't super well known. He was probably known a bit more in, in France than Spain, but he wasn't really known in either place all that much. Um, so, so he became a kind of, really a kind of celebrity martyr a little bit in 1906 when he was arrested. 
Um, as far as Latin America goes, I believe that there were newspaper articles about it. I don't think there were a ton of demonstrations. I think maybe there were a handful. Um, but then, of course, in 1909, he was executed and executed on the heels of the biggest rebellion Spain had seen in decades. Um, and then, of course, the more that people started creating schools based off his ideas, although I always put the asterisk that it was more how people imagined his ideas, really, in most right. cases. Right. Um, that sort of created momentum for it. Now, as far as his legacy in Latin America, I'm going to sort of say a little bit, and then you can you can talk about it too. Um, there's obviously a long-standing relationship born out of history, born out of language between Spain and Latin America, and that was true for the anarchists and various radical movements as well. And so there was um, there was an awareness of what was going on on both sides of the Atlantic in these movements. And so um, that was true in earlier examples of state repression in Spain against um, the workers' movement that, that Latin America was keeping tabs of what was going on, sometimes organizing solidarity events, sometimes writing about it. And that continued up through Ferrer's execution. And um, some of the most important and successful experiments in Ferrerian education occurred in, in Argentina or Brazil or, or Cuba and um, some of the most um, militant protests as well. Um, in, in Europe, the biggest protests against his execution were in France, Italy, and Belgium. Um, and, and just to, 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 to say a few more things before I, I sort of turn that, that topic over to you, um, people generally sympathize or, or were outraged with what happened to Ferrer in Catholic countries to the degree to which there was anti-clericalism and in largely Protestant countries like the US or Britain to the degree to which they could use it as an example to say, see in Catholic Spain, they're back, quote unquote, backwards. Mm -hmm. And Ferrer supporters took advantage of both of those things to just try and, you know, to work it, so to speak. And so in the US after 1909, Ferrer and the Ferreri movement was big. There were a lot of significant schools um, in Detroit, in New York, subsequently Jersey, California, and elsewhere. So it, it's a bit forgotten. And, and I think that, that, that the big picture story is that the Ferrarian legacy really dies out most places around the world, around World War II. And the kinds of anti-authoritarian ped pedagogical ideas that come up after the World War II come from different sources and different traditions. And, and that's probably for the best um, because despite devoting myself to this work a lot, there's a lot of reasons to be critical and to to think twice about what the, the modern school was like and what it did. So can I turn the question back to you to 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 share with us your your insights into these dynamics in Latin America that's come up in your research um, or that you just happen to be familiar with? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I think that Ferrer and the modern school were huge, for example, in Puerto Rico, which is a case that I know fairly well. Um, Anarchism in Puerto Rico is a sort of a latecomer. And so I think the first anarchist, official anarchist organization emerged uh, or was organized in 1905. Although I, could, I have been able to trace the circulation of certain books and newspapers uh, since the 1890s, but it wasn't until 1905 that it became sort of an organized movement. And so by 1906, when Ferrer is first arrested, uh, there was a, uh, people were collecting funds and sending them to Europe uh, that was publicized in anarchist uh, print media, but it wasn't until 1909 when he was executed that he became sort of this huge symbol in Puerto Rico. And so you had social study centers, although we never had a modern school in Puerto Rico, we had a lot of social study centers that sort of used the rational education model. They called it uh, influenced by the modern school, but I agree. I think they were imagining uh, a certain pedagogical mo model that they attributed to Ferrer and the modern school, although I'm not sure how much they understood the modern school uh, or how much they had read, but it was influential. And so when he passed away, he was, when he was executed in 1909, uh, lots of social study centers changed their name to 13 Octubre to commemorate the date of his assassination. Uh, there was a uh, Karen Schaefer argues that it was it is perhaps the only street in the Americas named after Ferrer that we have it in Puerto Rico in Bayamón. Uh, so streets were named after Ferrer. Uh, the, he sort of his death became sort of a 
a, a, a symbolic ritual that was celebrated yearly, although that ceased to be the case in uh, in the 1920s. So it, he was well known in Puerto Rico, as you mentioned, Cuba had a strong modern school movement, uh, rationalist school movement, uh, and uh, the same in uh, Argentina. So, so yeah, so in, in terms of Puerto Rico, I, I think I, I, I agree with what you're saying in terms of how after 1909, his execution, execution became a symbol that allowed the modern school to proliferate as an idea, uh, particularly in the Caribbean region. Uh, and I know that in Central America, there's some work, uh, there's a comrade there, uh, Yaguno Tomas, who's doing some work in the modern school, but we don't know much about what was happening there. Yeah, um, it, it's fascinating stuff. I, I wanted to follow up with you. You talked about the kind of modern school spreading as a kind of idea that is then applied to the context. And so one of the things that I've found to be interesting not only in researching the modern school, but in researching anarchism in Spain or, or European radicalism um, is that as much, well, I mean, this, this, is, this is a lesson on history, right? As much as any of us try to make ourselves different from the prevailing ideas or contexts or conditions we're in, we can all only ever escape so much. Right. And so as much as 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 um, the anarchist movement in Spain or or perhaps in Latin America, but you, that's where the question will turn to you, may have been anti-imperialist, may have sought to destroy empire and destroy states, the kinds of intellectual weapons they used sh showed a lot of overlap with those used by the imperialists that they were arguing against. So in the context of the modern school, we can see this kind of unreflexive uh, celebration of um, progress from a European lens. Um, sometimes, occasionally, some um, some guest speakers of the modern school would glorify Christopher Columbus, for example. Um, I, I, I have more examples in the book, but but in short, um, I think that it's reasonable to say that, for the most part, I mean, I haven't really come across notable exceptions. Um, Western European radicals of, of whatever school had more overlap intellectually with those they were fighting than they may have liked to believe. Um, so turning the, the kind of point of view from Europe to Latin America, how much of that would you say was the same? Or, or, or to what extent do you think being in, in the other context and the other side of the Atlantic gave them a different vantage point on these ideas and traditions? What, what's your thought? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question, Mark, because I think it, it it goes into the sort of uh, colonial ontology of anarchism in Latin America, particularly because oftentimes these folks that I study in Latin America did not do a critical analysis of uh, the ideas that they were reproducing. So for example, uh, although they were advocating rational education and so they were going against La Patria, for example, in Cuba, although, you know, the modern school emerges in this sort of Republican formation moment. Uh, and, you know, there's a, a break with the Catholic Church. Uh, they were criticizing La Patria and they were progressive in terms of promoting naturism. But at the same time, they were also reproduce, reproducing certain logics that uh, were hierarchical. They were reproducing Malthusian logics. They were reproducing uh, raceless sort of democracy myths uh, that only reproduce anti-Blackness. Uh, you know, in Cuba, anarchism was a product of the white artisan uh, and working urban working classes. And also that reproduces certain notions. Uh, the same in uh, Argentina, for example, uh, these workers were in, in contact, as you mentioned, there was a lot of circulation of ideas and knowledge and print media across both sides of the Atlantic. And oftentimes uh, it was reproduced without taking into consideration the local conditions. And I think it goes back to this broader anarchist historiographical debate from the 1970s onwards of, uh, you know, that question, was, it anar was anarchism imported to Latin America or did we have this sort of uh, local creolized sort of movement. I'm, I'm 
heading towards the second point, like uh, part of that uh, answer. I think that it was a localized, creolized process, but it was oftentimes re it reproduced certain logics, uh, Eurocentric logics. There was a lot of aspirations, a lot of discourses around progress. Uh, it was a teleological understanding of history. Uh, it was rooted in positivism. Uh, and so oftentimes uh, education, particularly when we're talking about anarchist circles, in the cases that I know, which are Puerto Rico, Cuba, and Argentina, uh, it was about access, not about transforming education in itself. Uh, so they were saying that, you know, we need to provide uh, education to workers, uh, to folks that had been denied education in the past, but they were not talking about this sort of transformative sort of education. Uh, and at the same time, I also need to recognize that I'm looking at this from a 21st century sort of perspective. And so we need to also contextualize it in the historical moment that they were living in, uh, the access that they had to certain ideas. And so, yeah, so I think that oftentimes they ended reproducing certain logics that locally reproduce anti-Blackness uh, hierarchies based on gender. Uh, and definitely uh, there was this desire to become Westernized, to become occidental, to you know, be part of progress and enlightenment. Uh, and that oftentimes reproduced not only anti-Blackness, but also anti-indigeneity. In, in Latin America, uh, right? And so, yeah, so I, I think that that's a really important question that we need to grapple. And, and I think it goes beyond the sort of binary of is anarchism imported or not? Uh, so it's, you know, it's a question of what actually happened once uh, local anarchists began reproducing these ideas. Yeah, and, and you mentioned um, gender hierarchies. Ferrer is lauded um, for having co-education in his school. And sure, it's, it's good that he had co-education in school, but he explains the main reason from his vantage point why it was good to have co-education is because um, mothers transmit ideas to their children and men exactly. make revolution. Exactly. So he wanted to educate the mothers of future revolutionaries. Exactly. Right, um, but or even more than that, um, in my other work, the, the book that I, I posted the link about, I, I write about how campaigners against state abuses in Western Europe would challenge the claim to being civilized that the Spanish or French states would make. But in so doing, they wouldn't contest the notion of the quote unquote African savage. They would, they would yes. essentially say, yes, I mean, not literally, but essentially say, okay, Africans, Africans are savage, but so are you. Right. And, and it lost in that was like, hold up, you know, from our vantage point, of course, hold on, like you're missing the big picture. And and even when you come across critics, anarchist critics of Ferrer, like Ricardo Mea, who critiques Ferrer's positivism and his his concept of essentially planting ideas in the heads of children, he argues from the vantage point that what we need is a an, uh, ed uh, an educational form that's free of dogma or ideology. Of course, here assuming that that's possible, right? Free of ideology. Um, and, and the assumption is that therefore, if we allow this kind of um, uh, educational process that's free of preconceived dogma to unfurl itself, we will necessarily result, end up in anarchist ideas because they are the truth. Right? So it's sort of like you can see that, that even the mirror image of the intellectual apparatus being used still kind of comes back to similar kinds of conclusions. Um, right. But the other thing that I would also throw in that, that I think complicates the picture a bit is I've read some modern day Spanish and Catalan scholars writing about Ferrer's ideas. And one of them said something which I think is thought provoking is that um, from a kind of anarchist or radical perspective, the one thing that kind of could not be co-opted by the bourgeoisie in Ferrer's pedagogical vision is a commitment to anti-capitalism, anti-statism, which is to right. say that today, a lot of kind of anti-authoritarian educational forms have been recuperated in contexts where the results, um, you know, are, are bankers or what have you, right? So, so I, I don't, so, so 
there's the historical conversation and then there's the, the form and content, which I don't think is as straightforward as some people might think. Um, but, but anyway, um, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, building on that sort of complexity and the contradiction of some of these ideas, uh, you know, one of the, the things that I was very excited about in the book, and I think that I had mentioned this to you when you told me that you were working on this, is that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that Ferrer never actually publicly said that he was an anarchist. And so this is something that I also read in Angela Capelletti's book on uh, Ferrer in La Escuela Moderna. And, you know, I once mentioned this citing Capelletti and almost got into a fight with uh, a, a colleague. Uh, and so uh, another thing that I was interested in is his connection to the Masons. Uh, and, and so I just wanted you to talk a little bit about conducting research on things that are unspoken. So for example, how did you find out that Ferrer self-identified as an anarchist? Uh, what led you to that pseudonym? How did you find it? So I guess it's a question about archives. And, you know, I think it's a question about methodology. How, how, because, you know, oftentimes anarchists want to elude the state. Uh, and so the state is one of the uh, most important producers producers of archives. And so how do you how did you grapple with that in right. your research? Well, just to start with the calling himself anarchist, <clears throat> the closest he came was in an article where he said something to the effect of, "I am an anarchist only to the degree that I agree with certain of their principles, but not from a dogmatic ideological perspective." There is actually, though, some evidence to suggest that that article was um, ghost written by someone else, because this was during his campaign when um, Juan Monsain, the, the father of the legendary CMT leader Federico Monsain, Ferrer paid him to run his campaign. And, and in his memoirs, Monsain said, I'll only do it if you, if you let me write all your articles for you. Now, I don't think that we can 100% necessarily assume that this specific article, which was written during this period, was written by Monsain because he was the type of guy who, who may be embellished a bit, but it's possible. Nevertheless, the point, the, the bigger point is that publicly he didn't identify with a political sect or tendency because he wanted to sell an image that would allow him to keep his school open, that would um, allow him to earn respect pedagogically and so forth. As I mentioned earlier, behind the scenes, he wrote under the pen name Cero or Zero in English. Um, the story of how he came up with that is essentially that back in 1892, he had this rather um, not well thought, thought out idea of essentially creating um, this 100 man vanguard that would launch a revolution. And he was number zero, right? He was like mm. the kind of instigator of the 100. You know, his politics went through a lot of phases, right? Which is, I guess, not all that unusual for a lot of people. Um, and Alejandro LaRue, who became this kind of demagogic, increasingly right-wing populist figure in Barcelona politics, and then was later on uh, a conservative prime minister under the Republic who put down the Astorius uh, miners uprising, was like number one, and they were going to do it together. Anyway, that's a whole other story for the other book, if you're interested. Yeah. But as far as how that came out, um, I wish I could take more credit, but basically his comrades spilled the beans after he was killed. Mm. Um, so it's it's no it's been no mystery for a long time that the articles written by Cero were written by Ferrer or that he had these kinds of radical perspectives. The question is is more so, was he involved in the 1906 plot to kill the king? Was he possibly also involved in the 1905 plot to kill the king? Right. I wanted to ask you about that because you mentioned, you know, that you're almost certain. So I well, just wanted I, to. For the 1906 one, I think there's a lot of reason. Um, so Matteo Moral was um, the publisher of his, um, uh, the, the administrator of the publishing house, Modern School Publishing House. And it wasn't known at the time that Ferrer had sympathies for insurrectionary plots, but now that we have all of his papers and his articles, we know that he did, right? So according to several witnesses, including one of the people who was there, Ferrer, Moral, and a couple other people had lunch atop Mount Tibidabo overlooking Barcelona the day before Moral went to Madrid. Mm. 
Moral told all his friends, hey, I'm going for the royal wedding in Madrid. He would have mentioned it. Okay, fine. So he goes to, he goes to Madrid. He rents a room on Calle Mayor overlooking the, overlooking the return procession from the, from the wedding. Alfonso XIII, the king of Spain, just married um, an English princess, um, largely perhaps for geostrategic considerations as the kind of, you know, blocks of European powers are forming sides that, you know, Spain's navy had just been sent to the bottom of Manila Bay and British were the, the leading naval power, but that's another story. So they get married on the way home. Moral throws a bouquet of flowers out his window with a bomb in it and it explodes. A little side story is that the authorities had banned anyone from throwing things at the procession. Had they not banned the throwing things, no one would have noticed where the bomb came from. But everyone saw it falling because it was the only thing falling out the window. And so right away, it was they figured out where the boarding house was that he threw the bomb from. And he actually signed in using his own name, not a fake name. Anyway, I'm getting a little long-winded because I like this, this history. But um, where does he go after he, Morale escapes? He goes to visit this radical Republican, radical Republican newspaper publisher named Jose Nakins. And Morale says to Nakins, according to Nakins, oh, thank goodness that you know Francisco Ferrer. Thank you so much. The backstory to that is that um, a month earlier, Ferrer, uh, Ferrer didn't like Nakins, but Nakins had helped out Michel Angiolio, the Italian assassin of Prime Minister Canova several years earlier. So Ferrer writes him like a month earlier saying, I want to buy a lot of your books. And Nakins is like, WTF, why would you buy my books? And Ferrer says, oh, you know, they're interesting, don't worry. And he sends him a check for a thousand pesetas. And, and Nakins is like, this is weird. And then the day of the assassination, Ferrer writes to, to Nakins saying, um, I really, even if you don't want to sell me books, just, just cash the check, just cash the check. And then, of course, Morel shows up, Ferrer's comrade, saying, thank goodness you know Ferrer. There's a few other odds and ends, but it seems like he was involved in some way or another, at the very least, even in terms of trying to help him arrange a getaway. Um, and then there's, there's like little droplets of, of evidence that he was involved in a, in a similar attempt a year earlier in Paris um, because he corresponded with some of the alleged co-conspirators and he sent this incriminating telegram where he says that the date has been set for May 30th, which is the day the king arrives in Paris, you know. So um, he, he was a man of many political tendencies. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. And that's fascinating. And you mentioned Angelillo, and, you know, there's this story that we don't know if it's fact or fiction of this Puerto Rican revolutionary in Paris, Ramon Ametario Betances, who Angiolillo visited and asked for money. Betances said, no, uh, do not kill the, the queen, I think it was. But then you should consider Canoa del Castillo. And the next day, the same amount of money he had asked appeared in front of his house. And that's the money he used to buy uh, his ticket to go to uh, kill Kanawa. Nothing. I, I find that fascinating. Uh, Mark, I wanted to, I think we're, uh, I don't know how we're doing on time, but I just maybe, wanted to ask you yeah, maybe, about your, 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 your like, like at eight o'clock or so, we can open it up for questions and stuff. Yeah. So I just had one last question about your, your forthcoming book. If you could talk to us a little bit about this project, how it ties to the book, or just what the book is about. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I said a little bit before, the, the, the main the main storyline is anarchists blow things up slash kill politicians, the state gets really mad, and then um, unleashes a lot of repression. The most famous uh, or most influential case that I look at is El Proceso de Montjuic from 1896 to 1900, where the Spanish state arrests um, somewhere between 400 and 800 radicals tortures some of them, execute some of them without evidence because of a bomb thrown into a religious procession in Barcelona in June of 1896. And my basic, the basic gist is that I, I argue that the campaign that develops in response to this bombing forms a kind of um, transnational solidarity template that is used by Spanish anarchists and their allies in five other campaigns over the next decade, two of which are Ferrer campaigns. Whereas similar repression 
prior to that in Spanish history hadn't generated the same kind of outrage. But the sort of more meta-theoretical argument I'm making is that um, if we look at some of these anarchist campaigners, some of them were simultaneously involved in planning propaganda by the deed and in organizing what I call human rights campaigns to push back against the state. And mm -hmm. so the meta, the meta theoretical historical argument is that maybe histories of quote unquote terrorism, I, I'm not a fan of the term, but as a shorthand, maybe terrorism and human rights are not necessarily mutually exclusive and that thinking of the relationships between state violence, anti-state violence, and um, rights beyond the state are more intertwined than we might imagine. That, that's the kind of theoretical payoff. But it's really, it's a narrative book that has a lot of stories, some of which we talked about. And um, what drew me to it primarily was the stories, um, because they're just, they're just fascinating. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I think we should... Yeah. Oh. Um, all right, so how about, let me take a look at some questions. Um, okay, so, um, okay, let, let's, I'll just go in order. So um, Sam um, has a question. I'll read out loud for everyone. Um, I'm going to start TAing next semester for my PhD. Good luck with that. I am required to give grades despite the fact that I'm philosophically against it. How can anarchist teachers work within this grade system while also breaking down the idea of performance measurements? Jarrell, do you want to take that one first? Uh, sure, I don't have an answer for that. I think, you know, one of the things that you have stressed throughout the conversation is that we are walking contradictions uh, and, you know, we're full of all this complex contradictions. And I think that Ferrer embodied that. And so, I just say that as a caveat to, you know, teaching in higher ed, uh, you know, the late uh, Dave Graver used to say that it's one of the two institutions that have survived almost intact from the middle ages, which are the university and the church. So, you, you know, already we have to make some compromises to be in a university classroom in itself. So do whatever you see fit. The short answer would be give everyone A's. Yeah, what I, I would start, <laughs> when I talk about this, I usually start with capitalism, that workplaces are hierarchical and regardless of your values, if you want to continue to be employed in them, to some extent you need to um, do what your boss tells you um, or form such a powerful union that you can tell them to go shove it. But um, if you have a grad student union, um, then, then that'll help. But anyway, um, so, you know, if your job is to give grades um, and you want to keep your job, you, you give grades. If, if your job is to work in, you know, in, in a store selling products at a price you think is unfair, you have to do that if you want to keep the job, right? So I, I think that, that there's only so much that we can do within capitalist workplaces, regardless of what our job is. And, 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 and I also would argue that there's only so much pedagogically that you can do in a capitalist educational environment as well. That we, we you know, as people who want to build a new world, we, we try to chip away at the kinds of um, misinformation that contributes to, to keeping us stuck where we are. But I'm not personally of the opinion that we can make the revolution solely through teaching in a capitalist um, educational environment, which raises the question of how we can create more liberatory spaces for learning and teaching outside of capitalist spaces. And, and that's awfully tough. That's part of the question that Ferrer raised, even if he didn't necessarily do it in the way that we would, would argue for today. But um, I, I, I mean, <laughs> there, there, there is, of course, um, you, you, the last thing I would say is just you know, be a human being. Um, and, and that will take you far. Okay. Paul um, said, asks, anarchism seems to put greater emphasis on pedagogical activity than any other political ideology. Um, we, we can get into that, but I'll read the question. It also aims at forms of education outside the school, such as public pedagogy through art, protests, propaganda, etc. Why is education so distinctively important for anarchism? And what forms of education, other than schooling, have anarchists pursued or practiced? How does this relate to prefigurative politics? Very good question, Paul. 
um, feel free to jump in if you if that sparks something on your part. But I would throw out that I, I, th I think that Marxists would probably take issue with the notion that anarchism is more devoted to pedagogy. But, you know, I'll, I'll leave that. That's not really the point. Right. Anarchism has been very devoted to pedagogy. Um, but I think also there's the question of what constitutes pedagogy, which Paul is pointing to. Um, there's an interesting article in, in Anarchist Education in the Modern School about the similarities and differences between educating, particularly when it comes to children and political propaganda. Um, and the argument that this author makes is that we can't treat them the same. Um, the, the author may, you know, spells it out more, more clearly, but the gist being that there's a difference between sort of speaking to adults in a movement context where you're trying to kind of hammer home a point and create political power versus in, in, an, in a kind of school setting where you're trying to foster certain ways of thinking and trying to work as particularly with children who are at you know, a formative stage in their life. Um, but um, I, the other thing I'd throw in is that for Ferrer, education was such a big deal because he had this idea that the root of everything that's wrong is in one form or another ignorance, he would probably say more or less. And that of course is very much a product of its time. Um, I think fewer anarchists would put it in those terms today than they did back in the day. But certainly historically, um, anarchists were on the one hand, very much in a hurry, right? They wanted a revolution now. They didn't usually believe in the same sort of, um, you know, notion of historical eras and, and and transformation that, that many Marxists did. They wanted a revolution now, but they also believed that that would only succeed to the degree to which they could uproot the kinds of social forces that were keeping things how they were. And that, and that um, for many anarchists of the era, the Catholic church was sort of the epitome of the institution pushing in the other direction. That was particularly true in Spain um, and, and parts of Latin America, of course. And sort of in that sense, education was seen as kind of a long-term antidote to that, I think, for a lot of these folks. Yeah, can, can I? Yeah, well, of course. Okay, thoughts? Yeah, you know, I, I just wanted to mention that also, and I think, Paul, if I'm not mistaken, if you are the same Paul I'm thinking of, uh, you might have taken a class with me last term. Uh, if, if that's the case, saludos, and it's great to, to see you here. Uh, also, I just wanted to mention the Anarchists believe in the revolution as a social process, not merely a political one. And so that entailed the transformation of their social relationships as well. Uh, and I think that's still the case today. And so it, it makes me think of, for example, what Malatesta used, used to say when he mentioned that anarchism is not about attaining anarchy today or tomorrow, but walking towards anarchy today, tomorrow, and forever. And I'm, I'm uh, paraphrasing. And I, I think that something that Mark just mentioned is really important that early 20th century anarchists were highly influenced by the ideas of the time, particularly enlightenment and ideas like, you know, uh, Rousseau's tabula rasa, that people are inherently good and the, the society and capitalism has corrupted them. And so one answer to ask Mark Hussein was education. And I think it ties to the prefigurative politics in terms of if we think about it nowadays, uh, you know, we might not achieve the revolution tomorrow or next year, but we can still create spaces uh, where we can uneducate ourselves and create other forms of relating uh, of relating to each other. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that's why uh, education was so important for early 20th century anarchists, and I think it still is. And I agree with Mark that Marxists would have a problem with saying that anarchists uh, believe or, or have stressed out the educational component of it more. I think we have done a better job than Marxists. So. Well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get into that debate. But um, next we have um, someone uh, who wished to remain anonymous asked, would love to hear the sordid details of his relationship with women, or at least where to read about that. Thank you. Well. That's fine. Um, first of all, where to read about it is in my book, which Jarrell has on display. Um, I do get into all of that um, and, and stuff with his daughter. So 
without going too far into it, um, when he was, let's see, how old was he? He was in his early 20s. Um, he, he met a woman on the train named Teresa, who claimed that she was being sent to go into a convent against her wishes. Now, this trope of young women being forced into the clergy against their wishes and sort of these masculine young anti-clericals saving them was a huge deal in Spain in the late 19th century, it was the subject of plays and stories. And so clearly Ferrer saw himself in that role and he basically said, no, come away with me. Um, from there, the relationship was downhill. Um, they, she did not like his politics, his, his involvement in Freemasonry. Um, he saddled her basically with all of the domestic responsibilities. She gave birth to seven children in the course of their relationship. Only three survived into adulthood. And um, they essentially kind of separated in the mid 1880s. He went to Paris by himself, left her with the kids. They sort of reconciled and she came over. But by the mid 1890s, their relationship had gone sour and she shot him. You didn't see that coming. No, she actually did shoot him. She, she, she pulled the gun, shot him. It only kind of grazed him. He wasn't seriously harmed. Uh, she claimed that he had sent away her daughter to Australia without notifying her. He had indeed sent their daughter to Australia to live with her uncle. She had been notified. She knew exactly where the daughter was going, but she was upset with him. That pretty much ended that relationship. She actually, um, his first, his, his only wife, Teresa, um, got, got in a relationship with some sort of um, Ukrainian aristocrat, moved to St. Petersburg, and um, his daughter, which one was it? Sol Ferrer, grew up in St. Petersburg without knowing him, and then subsequently did her PhD at the Sorbonne about Ferrer years later and, and unearthed a lot of information that we have available today. After that, he um, started a relationship with one of his teachers at the modern school, Leopoldine Bernard, he couldn't um, divorce Teresa, his wife, because Spain didn't allow divorce. So he was married to her throughout, but they, they were done. She had one son with Leopoldine Bernard, but then he met a different teacher at the modern school who he, who he started a relationship with, and Leopoldine actually moved to Amsterdam with their son, Riego. And I think she... Um, may have started a relationship with a Dutch anarchist, Domela Neuenhaus. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his name, but if you are familiar with him, you know who I'm referring to. And then his, his third main partner was Soledad Villafranca. And um, she, the, 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 the main story I'll tell about her is that when Mateo Moral threw the bomb at the king in 1906, and then subsequently took his own life, at the trial, Via Franca claimed that he did it because he was madly in love with her and she rejected him. Um, those who know Moral said, no, he did it because he, he wanted to blow up the king and he was a political person and so forth. But it seemed to be a Ferrer defense strategy to separate this act from him. This was just a guy who was heart, heartbroken and, and he did his things, nothing to do with Ferrer. Um, and um, yeah, so, so basically, um, there are kind of testimonies of his daughters that um, Trinidad Paz and, and Sol about him. Some of them sort of adopted his ideas, some didn't. Um, they, they defended the notion that he was a good father, but of course this is in a context where everyone was trying to call him a demon. Certainly he was a very traditional when it came to gender, when it came to domestic responsibilities. Um, and and that's, that's it. There, there's, you know, more little fun details about how Ferrer didn't get along with his mother-in-law and so forth in the book, if, if you want that kind of uh, stuff as well. But, but that's sort of what I would say in short. Um, unless you want to jump in on that, Jarrell, I'm going to move on to another question. Um, uh, let me see here. So, um, all right, there's a couple of similar questions about, about um, the question of content and form in education at the Escuela Moderna, and then this one seems a little similar. Um, you, you mentioned that there are more modern schools of more modern schools of thought and practice on anti-authoritarian education that might be more useful than Ferrer's. Could you briefly discuss the shortfalls of Ferrer's theory and practice and how improvements that have been made in more modern? Um, okay, so to kind of recap. 
for Ferrer, the goal of education was to put the right ideas in people's heads. So when he, when he assessed the state of education in France when he was living there, his main critique was that the books regurgitated traditional thinking. And so he wanted to put the right ideas in, in students' heads. So initially, the modern school was structured sort of like a normal school, um, normal kinds of subjects. He basically, he just wanted radical teachers putting the right thoughts in students' heads. He, he was not particularly concerned with form, although certainly the form was different from like a kind of authoritarian Catholic school in 1900. Um, the, you know, the students, for example, could, during recess, they could make loud animal noises, right, which was seen as something that was like, you know, at a Catholic school, apparently that would have been frowned upon, right, that would have been inappropriate. Um, the, he and his school put a big emphasis on hygiene, which may surprise some readers as a point of emphasis, but this, of course, again, reflects the prevailing um, kind of scientific modernist wisdom that progress and advancement in fighting disease, in being civilized and so forth and so on, is through washing hands and, and related practices, teaching the children, teaching the children's parents how to bathe properly, which is not to say that we shouldn't learn how to bathe properly if we don't know, but you know, it's reflective of sort of how social change is understood. Um, and that, that, that improved a bit over time. So for example, I have in the book, grades. Initially, the first year of the school, students did receive grades. And not only did they receive grades, their grades were published in the school newspaper for everyone to read what grade they had, sometimes with commentary about how they were lazy or need to work harder, which is, you know, <laughs> worse than in that regard than what we have in public schools today. Um, but that was only the first year. And then they stopped doing that. Um, they also, the first year, published how often the students were late to school, presumably in an effort to shame their parents to get them on time. And students that were habitually late couldn't go on the school field trips. After the first year, they got rid of that too. So they do, they do seem to have moved towards Ferrer's later ideas, which he published. The book he published, the modern school book, was, of course, a reflection on what he came to think about how schools should be run by the end. He didn't mention that in the, in the book. Um, and he was critiqued by folks such as Ricardo Mea and some of his um, some other of his colleagues, including the first director of the modern school, who argued that education should be neither anarchist nor monarchist nor Catholic nor this nor the other. It should just be about truth. Well, um, certainly there's there's a critique to be had that 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 all forms of, I mean, arguably all forms of human behavior are in some form or another ideological or influenced by this, that, and the other. So the idea that you can escape that is another sort of product of its times, which is which is undergirded by a similar kind of intellectual apparatus from another direction. Um, but I, I, I do think that today, if people imagine what a kind of anarchist school would look like, most people would tend towards that more open-ended sense, right? Because obviously, the anarchist ideal is for all of us to be self-actualizing in communities with others. Um, and as much as we can try to inculcate that in the young, that's beneficial. Um, I'm, I'm not um, a history of pedagogy person. If my co-editor Rob Hayworth were here, he could talk about other experiments in other places that, that did more or less this. But I, I will briefly say that the modern school that was created in New York and then was moved to New Jersey because um, Alexander Berkman and his crew tried to blow up Rockefeller and failed. So the, these histories of propaganda by the education are interrupt that moved to New Jersey in, I think it was 1914. That school was much more open-ended, less explicitly ideological. Um, the, many of the former students have met annually to talk about their experiences. And I remember one student saying that um, he didn't want to read, he want, didn't want to learn to read when he was a kid. So he didn't. But then when he was around 10 years old, he saw these comic books and he wanted to know what they were saying. So he's like, you know, I'm gonna learn to read. And he learned to read shortly thereafter, he was like 11, and he became an engineer as, as an adult. So, so certainly that kind of small anecdote, not necessarily representative, I don't know if it is, suggests that there is something to be said for student actualized learning. Um, although I would have my kids learn 
to read younger whether they wanted to or not, which of course points to other questions about what does it mean to be self-actualizing if you don't necessarily yet have the full maturity to do that for children? It's a big question and I don't pretend to have the answers, but those are some, some thoughts and observations about that. Anything you wanna throw in on that, Jarrell? Let's see if we have anything more before time's up. Um, anything more you can discuss about Ferrer's involvement with Freemasons? Sure. So I, I, I still remember being a young person and reading about the Nazis, um, you know, of course, um, killed and brutalized Jews and, and Roma people and, and a wide variety of people. And among, I remember reading among the list was Freemasons. And I, I just thought like, what the heck, like, what? Like, I didn't even know like really what that was or was a thing. And then of course, subsequently I've learned that Freemasonry became by the late 19th century, this kind of, for lack of a better phrase, social space that connected all sorts of different radicals and anti-clericals across traditions and across geographies. And at times was a very valuable network. Um, it came, became a very, very, very valuable network in the defense of Ferrer in 1906, 1907, it's argued. And um, Charles Mulatto, um, who was a French anarchist who was charged with the assassination attempt on the king the year earlier was also an influential Mason and also allegedly got off because of his Masonic connections. Um, especially in a place like France, you'd have prime ministers and anarchists who were sort of part of the same um, entity in this, free, in this Freemasonry. So this gave Ferrer an opportunity to network with a lot of people sort of behind the scenes, um, anarchists, um, Republicans, other kinds of radicals, um, free thinkers, educational figures. And Ferrer apparently reached there are, I, at least at the time, there were 33 levels in masonry and he was 31 out of 33. So he was a pretty big deal. But even that, you know, was no sort of um, political panacea because when he got in hot water, some of the Masonic lodges rallied to his support, others didn't and were critical behind the scenes and, and withdrew support. So it's not as if that kind of unity always held um, court, but, um, it certainly was influential in, in the world he was in. He was a member of the Masons since 1883 when he was then about 24 years old. And a lot of his collaborators were as well. Um, it opened up to a lot of radicals when they dropped the requirement that you had to believe in God, which happens at some point in the 19th century. I don't remember when it was. Um, although that only happened in some, some national lodges, not others, I think. Um, I'm not sure what else to say. How much does masonry come up in, in your research with your figures, Jerome? So that's a, that's a very interesting question because I don't know much about Freemasonry in the Caribbean, but uh, I know there's a fantastic work by Josiana Arroyo that covers that. But in terms of anarchism, I know that there were certain or some intersections in Puerto Rico and not only with Freemasonry, uh, but also there's an on tap sort of world with espiritismo, uh, this Allen Kardec sort of vein of French uh, espiritismo in Puerto Rico. And so you had a lot of anarchists that were publishing in espiritista publications and a lot of them participated in Masonic lodges. But one of the things that I'm interested about this is, you know, they did not keep open records or archives. So it's a challenge just to access uh, those sources and to like craft this sort of Masonic or Espiritista, or I'm also interested in the intersections and that's later in the 20th century with uh, Santeria as well and uh, other forms of, of re religiosity and, and, you know, secret societies and all those sorts of things. So there are lots of intersections that I know are there, but I haven't been able to uncover them in the archive uh, I know that Kirk Schaefer has done some work with Espiritismo and with Freemasons in the Caribbean, Josiana Arroyo, but there's not much that we know concretely about the topic. But I was fascinated when I read that Ferrer was, you know, 31 on this sort of hierarchy of Freemasonry. So that meant that he was quite powerful in those circles, but yeah. Yeah, and, and between the wealth he had and the Masonic connections and, 
you know, th that just fed into all of the conspiracy theories about what, what he was involved with, some of which may have been true, um, but, but plenty of others were not. And ultimately, um, he was executed essentially for a conspiracy theory that he was behind um, the Barcelona tragically, um, which he, he was not by any stretch. Um, we have another question um, from Christy. Hi, Christy. Um, besides the New Jersey school, which ended in the 40s, what was the total number of modern schools in the US? I don't know the total number offhand, but um, I would estimate that maybe there are a couple dozen at any point or another. Most of them were pretty um, short-term uh, experiments. I mean, most of these modern schools in general around the world didn't last more than a couple of years, but some of them lasted for five, 10, 20 years. Um, but I mentioned some in the school. Paul Average has a book on the modern schools in the US. I'm just gonna track that down for folks. Uh, I'm gonna put that, um, AK Press has the, the modern school movement, Paul Average, and that would be uh, a better source for that because my book is really uh, focused on the Barcelona school. But I, I'm gonna take the opportunity to, to just to mention that arguably the, the country with the most important and meaningful Ferrari movement was Spain during the Spanish Revolution, because in the areas that experienced the revolution, Ferrer's ideas were the foundation of anti-authoritarian educational institutions that sprung up. And presumably, although I haven't you know, dug into this aspect of it, they had a better idea of, of what he was up to than people elsewhere, if only because there was a kind of generational continuity of people who, who knew him and were involved in his initiatives. And while the modern school was around, there were other similar kinds of schools in Spain that used modern school books. So, but I'm not sure the exact number on, on the US. Um, I think we might be out of uh, audience questions. If you are watching and have a question, this would be the ideal moment to zing it in there right before we go. Um, but seeing as there isn't one, Jarrell, I wonder if to wrap up, I could come back to you um, about your current research. If you could tell us about how some of these things interact with you, your forthcoming book, if you want to stick a link yeah. in the chat to, to promote that. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Let me just... While Jarrell is yeah. typing it up, I want to say it's going to be awesome. I don't know when it'll come out. The lettered Barriada. And also Jarrell yes. wrote Voces Libertarias about the history of anarchism in Puerto Rico. There you go. Well, you can I, check it out. I, I just sent it to Paul. I'm sorry. I, I was going to write hi and never did. And so just sent it to you now i sent it to everyone uh yeah so i it, it comes up in my book not much uh because i covered uh ferrer and la escuela moderna in voces libertaria so uh there were some particular events because one of the chapter looks at how labor rituals and public events allow puerto rican workers to imagine themselves as part of a global labor community and so i'm looking at particular representations of Ferrer's martyrdom in Puerto Rico. So it comes there, but I'm currently working on a project of uh, an anarchist couple from Colombia that you mentioned in the book, Juan Francisco Moncaliano and Blanca Moncaliano. And so they were two uh, avid followers of uh, Francisco Ferrer y Guardia. And so they are expelled from Colombia because they had this publication called El Rabachol which was anti-clerical. And although Colombia was a, a republic back then, it was dominated by, in the early 20th century, by conservative politics and the Catholic church had a lot of power, power to censor newspapers, to uh, get the government to persecute uh, radicals. And so they get uh, expelled from Colombia in 1909. They arrive in uh, Cuba that had a strong anarchist movement and infrastructure that was able to uh, accept them and, and uh, give them lodging. Uh, and so they also participate in the Ferrarian movement in Cuba. Uh, and this is something that you also mentioned in the book. Uh, they, she was in charge of El Cerro school. Uh, and so they're there for about a year. Uh, and then Moncal Juan Francisco goes to uh, 
uh, Mexico while the revolution is happening. He gets expelled from Mexico uh, after founding or laying the foundations for La Casa del Obrero Mexicano. And then, so it's, it's so I'm looking at their travels. And so they were Ferrerians. There's a question about Ferrer's influence in Mexico. Do you think you could just elaborate a little more on the Mexico part of that story? Yes, and I think that's that's unfair because Mitchell has <laughs> one of the <laughs> best books on on uh, Mexican anarchism, uh, his uh, Magong book. Uh, so that's that's a bit unfair. You you could answer that, Mitchell. But uh, in terms of that research, uh, so the, I'm looking at. Juan Francisco Moncaliano and his short stay in uh, Mexico in 1910. And so he laid the foundation for a, a Grupo Luz, who also, they also published a newspaper and they were uh, going to open a rationalist school uh, and also lay the foundations for La Casa del Obrero Mexicano. So it was there from the beginnings of the Mexican Revolution, but I don't think I'm adequate adequately equipped to talk about the Ferrarian movement in Mexico. Uh, I would consult Mitchell Berger's work or John Hart's work. Uh, so it, it was important. I will say that uh, Los Magonistas and Regeneración were the biggest supporters of the Moncalianos in Mexico, but then there was a conflict with the Moncalianos in Los Angeles when Moncaliano was accused of trying to steal the newspaper while the Magonistas were in prison. And so the Regeneración newspaper began this campaign against Juan Francisco Moncaliano, accusing him of, uh, how do I say this in English, of uh, inappropriately touching schoolgirls in Cuba. And so that's something that I just found out. And I think that's important information. And I'm still trying to process and think about how to grapple with those accusations seriously uh, while well, they were part of this broader sort of conflict between the Magonistas and uh, Juan Francisco Moncaliano. And so it, it's, you know, it, it poses questions uh, of relation, uh, the, the relations that they built with their students. Uh, and so, yeah, but I, I wouldn't be the person to answer in regards to the for our movement in Mexico. I don't know if you have any thoughts. Mark. I have a couple of paragraphs on Mexico, which I have not read in a couple of years. So I just, there is information in the book and there's references in the book that people can pursue. I think a good place to finish is the question on why the, the, the um, you just want to ask, just want to take this, why did the schools fail? Um, maybe that's not a happy way to end, but they, they generally failed for the same reason that most radical initiatives fail, which is either repression. In many cases, it was repression. Um, in Spain, they failed because Franco won. Um, in other contexts, it was repression. Or, you know, they were, in some cases, they were the kinds of project of, um, you know, individuals who carry them forward and then something happened with the individual moved to a different place or became politically inactive or, or passed away or what have you. Um, but I think the general story of their overall trajectory was that they, you know, they, they corresponded to a kind of time in history where certain educational initiatives were um, prioritized. And then after World War II, the relationship between radicalism and education just looked differently. Um, so Ash, if you, I'm sorry to have, uh, yeah. No, no problem whatsoever. I mean, I imagine we could go on talking likely for hours. Um, it, it, it's been absolutely fantastic to hear both Mark and Jorel kind of bounce ideas off each other, bounce uh, their wealth of knowledge on these different topics. Um, and how they relate to one another. Uh, so thank you so much to both of you. Also really wanna thank uh, folks who were in attendance tonight um, to, uh, in supplying some really great questions um, to both our speakers to kind of riff off of. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you both of you so much. It sounds like there's uh, some books coming out ahead in the future. So perhaps um, we can make further conversations happen, whether they're in person or whether we uh, find some time for another another virtual event where uh, all the folks and attendees can come back um, and we can revisit some, some of those ideas and topics together. Super, thank you. Thank you, cool. thank you, Ash. And thank you for, uh, 
to everyone at Firestorm. Absolutely, yeah. And for folks um, who are interested, anybody who signed up um, for this event tonight, we will follow up with an email with a uh, link to the recording. Um, and there'll be links to the books and stuff in there as well. Um, so if you haven't gotten a chance to check it out yet, again, Anarchist Education and the Modern School, there is the book. Jarell's got it there as well. Um, and Please interrupt. One, one of the attendees, um, presumably from Brazil, put this in, in the Q&A and I put it in the chat. They're organizing an international colloquium on the Modern School in Brazil in November. Um, so uh, that, that information is in the chat. Yep, the link is there in the chat for anybody interested in that. And thank you so much uh, to who it was who submitted that, Rodrigo. Like I said, really, really vibrant audience tonight, which always makes for a great event. So thanks so much, y'all. We'll see you again soon. Good night. Bye now.